Welcome to the Online Success Journey Podcast, your opportunity to discover and learn from entrepreneurs like yourself. This is not your typical podcast, but a place where you can get the real story and find out how real people encounter speed bumps and detours, but journey through to find success. Now here's your host for the Online Success Journey Podcast, Patience. Hello everyone and welcome to Online Success Journey. This is episode 277. Today we have Sean Livermore, a tech startup founder, entrepreneur, author of the average job bestseller on Amazon and a technology consultant for over 20 years. Hello, Sean. Hi, Patience. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. I know the clan is anxious to hear your story, so let's get started with the basics. Can you tell my clan a little bit about your background, about what you did before you started your own businesses? Sure. I am a software developer and consultant. I run a software consultancy in Southern California called Product Perfect. You can find us on the web at productperfect.com. I have been in technology for 21 years now and launched several startups and raised venture funding six times. And along the journey, I've learned quite a bit. And, and that has culminated into the first on business nonfiction book of the three books that I've written. And this book is called Average Joe. You can find more about that at averagejoetechgenius.com. So that's the book. That's me. Uh, there's lots to talk about. What, where should we begin? Wow, what a journey, Sean. What is the most dangerous belief an entrepreneur can have? What is the most dangerous belief that an entrepreneur can have? I would, I would dare say that uh, the most dangerous belief is that they don't belong. You know, I think the, the mental gymnastics that we deal with on a daily basis in our minds that, you know, where do we fit? Where do we sit on the spectrum of success? And there's a lot of hype and hustle on Instagram and on LinkedIn. And there's so many <laughs> energetic and enthusiastic entrepreneurial minded uh, voices that will tell you to get up at five in the morning and work more hours. And, you know, if you don't know something, go learn it, you know, and it just kind of just throwing uh, mental vomit out there that has not really benefited humanity. Right. And I think there are a lot of people that are on the freeway or I guess with COVID, you know, logging into their daily Zoom calls and kind of fighting through that pay the mortgage, paycheck to paycheck, even in the tech industry where, where most people make a decent living. You know, there, there are a lot of people that are just getting by and there is no wiggle room. There is no room for exploratory work where you have a dream, you have a vision, you create a company, you see it through. Uh, and all the forces of the earth are are fighting against you and you're swimming upstream to try to achieve some sort of goal. Right? And this is the plight of the innovator. This is the dreamer's problem, the, the greatest challenge. And so the most dangerous belief I think with that in mind are that I don't belong in this rat race. You know, I can't, I can't win. It's unwinnable. Right. Wow. How did you win the rat race? <laughs> but, you know what? I exited the rat race. I'm, I'm not going to play by those rules. Uh, yes, I have a mortgage. Yes, I have a family. Yes, I have clients who pay me money and I work for them uh, looking to build my business so that I can get off the treadmill. But, you know, saving for retirement and doing all the things that you're, you're supposed to doing. So I'm checking boxes. But at the same time, I'm multi-threaded. So some of my day is spent on my daydreams and some of my day is spent on my day job. And I think we all should have some sort of multi-threaded minded approach to our work where we are, we do have the eternal, the, the future, uh, the long-term in mind as we work on the short-term, because if you ignore those long-term uh, larger arc story narrative of your life moments, you'll never get there, right? If you leave your future up to someone else, someone else is going to tell you how it's going to end. And so you, you kind of have to be the, a little bit of the captain of your own ship, right? I mean, I know you can't mastermind everything, but but certainly you don't want to leave it up to others. Okay, as you mentioned earlier, there are some people that are telling you get up at five o'clock, and others you you said five o'clock, others are saying four o'clock. <laughs> so I don't know what time they go to bed if it's six to four. I don't know. So when you are not doing your 
De- you are dead, remember you are working for your clients. What time do you wake up? What is your schedule? Yeah, okay. Uh fair enough. I probably have a 7:30 wake up call. My 2-year-old kind of dictates that on a daily basis, so mm-hmm. I don't even have to set an alarm. She she wakes the whole house up, but uh 7:30 a.m. I probably crash out around 10:30, 11 p.m., so a little bit old fashioned, but I really try to try to get that 8 hour sleep in as much as I can. It really is good for the body. So I was thinking maybe I'm going to tell Matt three of rock for his yeah. <laughs> for his already too late. Okay. You've been in the business for a long time, but why do you do what you do now, Sean? I love creating perfect products. That's why the name of the company is Product Perfect. You know, we at my team that I'm building here we love looking at old ugly software and transforming that into new beautiful software so if you're out there and you're running a company and you you know you have plenty of targets for old and ugly software please let me take a look at it as we like to transform that that's what i why i do what i do it's it's a it's a wonderful feeling to see technology you know redeveloped and then see that redeveloped effort turn into numbers on a balance sheet and and where a company truly saves millions of dollars one of my, our clients we are completing a year long uh, enterprise architecture assessment and and working on some of the software uh, with a team of 10 people and one of the things we've seen is we're probably going to save them several million dollars a year at minimum with this one project and maybe the next project might save them much more than that so we're excited about those projects and, and there is a dopamine kick i think that that comes out in in some of that work the other side of it is the startup world saas products building my own my own dreams out and and instead of just working on my clients dreams you know i i want to build saas products myself so i'll get there one day but um i really have a passion for building a beautiful product what would you say for some people nowadays a 9 to 5 job is in I don't know if it's going to happen in 2021 but it's going discuss what would you say for someone who wants to go and venture online and start their own business and what is happening now what advice would you give them I would say to really focus on a narrowly scoped niche and I know that other people have said this before it's not brain science but I think we discount that the power of that you know so often you'll find a consultant online and and they'll charge quite a high rate let's say 300 400 US dollars per hour and you ask how in the world can you justify that in the tech industry maybe as an attorney you know but if if you're narrowly scoped to very very specific technical frameworks where you are the author of that framework or you you have pushed a thousand commits to GitHub on that framework or you're a contributor to that framework you are expert level master craft level um value and you come into the picture in 4 hours you can do what it would take 4 months for someone else to do and i think if if you really want to find yourself at the top of a pyramid you got to go build that pyramid yourself and then stand on it so mm, it's easier said than done but uh that i think if i could give advice to anyone jumping in to the tech industry or or looking to reposition themselves i think that's probably a good place to start let's put him on aside how do you know you are successful well i i certainly it's not all money driven that's for sure right i mean mm-hmm. there's a lot of unhappy wealthy folk i would say success is a difficult word for me i think as a personality type i think about that word sometimes but um when you can when you can be loved and love others right let's get a little bit romantic with it if you can find your way through the world if you can know god and and receive him into your life uh, i'm as a christian that's what i believe and then second to that of course if you can find love and love others and be a part of other people's story and and share share your life with them that's the second layer i think below that doing the work that you love whether it makes a ton of money or makes just enough money to get by but if you're really excited about your work every day and i think that goes anecdotally to personal experience you know when i was working on my startups i was losing money failing miserably but i woke up every day with enormous energy and i pop out of bed 5 in the morning ready to work you know and i couldn't wait 
to get up the next morning and work on it because it was my it, it was my joy it was just a, a a true passion project and if you can find that you're lucky and it's hard to get there where you can financially sustain yourself and work on something that gets you out of out of bed with energy at five in the morning but how do you know if you're truly successful i, I think it's such a layered answer you know Okay, you said you had that energy, but you are losing money. What was your friends or your family thinking or telling you that, look, this project is not going to work. You are losing a lot of money and you are spending time on it. What were they thinking and what was your answer to them? Uh, you know, when you hear the voices of those around you saying, hmm, I'm not so sure about this idea of yours, <laughs> you know, I think that's what you're getting to, right? It's, yes. I, I think you should listen. I think that so often we get, we fall in love with our work when we shouldn't, you know, work is just work. It's just experiments. You know, you know, when, when your startup is not doing well, it, it, it's not an indicator of success or failure. It's just an indicator of experimentation and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be too in love with it that you can't scrap it all and start over. And if you look at all the masterpieces by all the musicians, look at the trash can next to them, you know, it should be full of scrap paper. And the sketch and iteration of your life and your life's work uh, should be bountiful. And and you shouldn't be afraid of that process of iteration. But despite they told you, you kept going. So what was the secret of you keeping going? Apart from well, being I, I, energetic to jump out of bed at 5 a.m. Uh, you know, gosh, <clears throat> for one startup raising five rounds of funding, seed funding, at that it's hard and I shouldn't have done it. I should have stopped after, you know, pivoting and pivoting and pivoting and pivoting and, you know, never say never, never die, never quit. Well, those, those are great anecdotal. Those are great beliefs and philosophies when it comes to marriage and when it comes to, you know, relationships and children and, you know, all sorts of other areas of life. But when it comes to startups, <laughs> it's really not the right approach. You, you should say quit, 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 quit. Oh, maybe I'll keep working on it. Quit, 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 quit. You know, because the minute you say the word pivot, the investor rolls their eyes because like 80 to 90% at least of all pivots fail. And so you have to bear in mind the statistics are working against you. Now you do have those rare anomalies like Slack where they pivoted from a video game to a, a world-class business chat application. Okay. That aside, <laughs> and there are reasons that that worked, they were, there were so many reasons, one of which they had a seasoned executive behind the wheel who had already sold a company, Flickr, to Yahoo for $25 million in prior work. You know, so he knew what he was doing. They had investors that were behind him. They had a team that knew what they were doing. The, the quality workmanship by MetaLab to design Slack. And then Stuart Butterfield continued to move it forward toward a product release that got a lot of attention from the press. He already knew the press. He already had them in his back pocket. So it got plenty of free advertising. And then it just was a great product. It worked really well. And in, people were looking for that type of a product. So, you know, you can say they stumbled into it or you can say it was a, an iteration of an existing wheel that was already turning. So I don't know where I was going with that, but I think coming back to your other question, it, you know, quitting and, you know, sticking with it. I, th I think there is a level of determination that is, is for our benefit as entrepreneurs. You have to have an extremely determined focus to be able to work your day job and work your day dreams at the same time. At, in that same breath, you have to be very honest and realistic about proximity and money, time, energy, focus, leverage, you know, all these factors that come together that and timing that, that uh, product market fit, the lean framework at work, you know, iterating with the customer, getting that feedback cycle down really well. All of these factors play into your end result. And it certainly isn't a matter of, a matter of is not a matter of working hard enough or, um, you know, having the right twinkle in your eye or perfect teeth or, uh, you know, a good salesmanship about you, all those things can go out the window. It, it really is a combination of forces, some of which you can control, some you can't. Wow. Thank you for sharing. You've been in business for a long time. What have you learned from business as a whole? 
Um, that's a big question. I would say I've learned that anyone can create, anyone can, can build products, anyone can be successful in the tech industry. I mean, I mentor a couple folks here and there, and uh, I was just emailing back and forth with uh, someone who's looking to kind of find their fit and, and get situated in the tech industry. And they are looking to slot themselves into a certain type of role. And I'm, I'm trying to help them figure that out. I think what I've learned is that uh, there's so much more that, that the average Joe, hence the title of the book, average Joe, mm -hmm. there's so much more that the average Joe can do that they, they probably don't have any clue of, you know, and the, they've been nibbling around the edges of tech or trying to get themselves into a, a entrepreneurial position and and they're probably closer than they think. Um, but I think proximity is more important than talent. I think being close to people who are moving in the right direction, who have the right resources at their disposal is far more powerful than any intellectual or creative gifting that you may feel you have. Um, even though that may be strong and may be to your advantage, I, I think putting yourself in the wrong room will com completely diminish your, your propensity for success. So uh, let your light shine and and get that light out in a lighthouse so the boats can see it. In your businesses, you mentioned you mentor yourself. Do you ever have a mentor or coach? You know, I've had a few mentors over the years. Um, uh, yes. And I thank them for their help and, and their input. I wish I had more. Um, if you're out there and you'd like to be my mentor, <laughs> <laughs> come on down. It's, it's tough to find a good mentor, isn't it? It is. Okay. What is the most valuable thing your mentors or coaches has told you over the years? I would have to talk through that a little more and think about that. I, I think one time, uh, one voice, I've just had a lot of random voices that have spoken in to my life over the years. And one of them said a, a phrase when I was asking, should I go for it? Should I not? Should I launch my consulting business? Should I not? And he kind of squared me up and said, look at me for a second. And he said, three words. He just said, go for it. And that's it. Go for it. But in the moment, the way he said it and how I needed to hear it, some of that just kind of clicked for me. And I understood what he meant. What he was really saying was, look, don't worry about it. You're, you're, you're mentally, you, you have mental quagmires that you're fighting. You need to release all that and, and just put your hands into the clay and start, start shaping it. Because you, you, you figure it out, you know, as you go, there's an old Hebrew phrase, Asa Shema, and it means by doing, we will understand. By doing, we will understand. And I think Asa Shema applies today. I, I think it's truly relevant to have that experiential knowledge where tactily your fingers are keystroking it out and you're working out the details as you create the product, as you fashion the innovation, the details fall in line or they don't. And if they don't, great. That's also data. And um, that data is, is, is just as valuable as the other data, you know, and you have to receive it and be willing to, to listen to the data. What is the secret to creating a successful startup company? Well, I don't know if there's any one secret. I, I, um, I interviewed Sean Ellis, the originator of growth hacking for uh, the book and you know, Sean Ellis was the mystical tech genius figure that had walked into Dropbox in 2008 when they just had eight developers and uh, turned them into a one or $2 million startup into a $10 billion powerhouse that became a household name. And he's kind of the quintessential tech genius, if you will. But debunking that myth is kind of a part of the book. And what we do in the book is to unpack all that and, and to place yourself on the spectrum of creativity and intelligence and then find your way through that that smelly tunnel uh, to the other side where you can articulate your work in a way that other people are amazed by. Uh, but sitting down with Sean and talking through what he did there and how he did it, and, and he culminates all his interview with foot pointing back not to his intellect, not to his creative ability, not to his tech geniusness, but back to the product that those engineers created, that those developers created a brilliant product. And he said, that was the magic. That was the magic. And so to create a beautiful product, I, I really think 
or, or to make it a company successful, you really have to have a, a beautiful product. One of the co-founders of Twitter, Evan Williams, said it's always been about the product. You know, he's quoted as saying this. It, it was never about anything else. It's always been about the product and, and the UX. And anyone who misses that misses it completely. <laughs> so if you build a masterful software uh, a product or, or a beautiful website in terms of what it does, but it looks a little off and it, it's a little kludgy or, or when you click on things, it doesn't quite move and snap into place the way you'd expect it to, then you've missed it. You've missed the, the point, right? The user experience really truly has to be front and center. And that drives the software that drives what you build and why you build it. And if you start the other way as a, as a technical founder, you find yourself trying to build the thing, but not really knowing how it should look. Oh, I need to hire a designer. Well, no, you've already blown it. You know, <laughs> you need to partner. You need to partner with a designer. If you're a technical co-founder out there, don't just hire a designer, get another co-founder who has design chops, who can really walk with you through that that difficult journey and, and, and have the cap table and equity reflect that so that you're both in it together. That's one of the lessons that I learned is I tried to hire a designer. I tried to, to, you know, uh, share a few stock options with the designer. That doesn't really work. You, you really, you have to partner. They have to be in it with you. The long nights, the, the weekends, all the hard work, design and development, and maybe sales, those three parts of the, of the triad of, or the triangle of a, of a quality startup team um, that may look different for every company, but you know, that's just what I've experienced. What grounds you? What grounds me? Yes. What keeps me grounded? I would say my faith and my family. I have a wonderful wife and um, very fortunate to have my family and my faith. And I think career is always a distant second or third on the list, but um but yeah. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that has contributed to your success? Well, I'm a very determined person. So talent aside, intelligence aside, I think when I was a kid, they said I was a smart kid and they took me in and they, they tested my IQ. I was in like second or third grade. No, it was like third grade. And they did an IQ test. I think I came out at 143. It was either 134 or 143. And I thought, is that good? I asked. Him. <laughs> and my mom said, yes, that's very good. And I thought, oh, does that mean I'm special? Yes, Sean, you're very special. And I thought, oh, wow, I must be special because I'm smart. What's funny about this story is not that I'm trying to tell you I'm special. <laughs> it's that how ridiculous that is, right? As if, as if all the other kids in my class weren't just as wonderful and valuable as I was and, and weren't just as creative and capable as me. And when I sit down to code, I, you know, I'm not the best software developer. I never have been. I never claim to be, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I don't, I don't want to be the smart. I just, I want to get in other rooms where people much more brilliant than me or anything I've ever attempted to be, you know, it, it my, my moral of the story is like, how silly is that? Right. And, and how ridiculous that we, and I know I'm not alone. A lot of other people are like, huh, I wonder how, what my IQ is. You know, you're thinking that right now. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Don't get tested and, and don't ever try and, and completely eradicate IQ scoring and psychometrics in general from your vocabulary. Uh, you should not ever wonder, am I smart enough for this role? Uh, that should be obliterated. And, the effort and the, the curative process of your imagination and your hard work and the work of your hands should be flowing continuously toward the right proximity, the right angle, the right trajectory. And, you know, that's why the book exists is, is to take someone regardless of where they fall on the spectrum of creativity and intelligence and structured learning and all that, and put them through a process by which they, can curate their work. They can, they can narrow in and hunker down and, and, and narrowly scope the focus of their daily work to a point where they can become master class, master craft, that they are an expert and then learn how to articulate with as few words as possible, both the expertise that they work within and the problem that they're currently solving. And if you do that with narrative, with inversion, we use the API method and, and it's, um, 
analogy, portrayal, and inversion, API. So all the programmers out there, you know, what that phrase typically means is application programming interface, but uh, analogy, portrayal, and inversion, that's what we consider articulate speech. And so you learn how to present your pitch, present your information, whatever you're working on, the, the hard work of your hands, the clay that your fingers, your skin cells rub off into. You present that to your audience, you provide analogy, you portray that analogy with story and narrative, and then you invert it, you flip the switch, you, you, you use a contrarian mindset and, and frighten the crap out of them as they realize that you pulled the rug, you know, you, you, you bring them to a whole new place where it's much darker and much scarier than they thought. And then you, you present the solution to that. And that's kind of like the dig the knife portion of a pitch. When you're pitching to investors, you say, here's the problem and the pain of the customer. Then you exacerbate that problem. Then you dig the knife, make it even worse. And then you say, but aha, there's a solution, you know, and here's the startup that these experts have been dedicating their lives to for 20 years. And here's why we're best poised to solve the problem. And here's the progress we've already made. And here's all the partners that are jumping in with us. That's pretty compelling. So the book teaches you how to pitch, not just to investors, but to any other human being willing to hear your voice, right? And, and I think it's really critical because there's a lot of really intelligent people that I've worked with, really creative people, really clever, uh, really hardworking and determined faces that, I, that are popping up in my mind even right now that they can't speak to save their life. You know, they, they can't argue their way out of a paper bag. And, and yet they're trying to launch their best and greatest dreams and all the hard work of their life into the ether, but they're being rejected, not because it's not good enough. It's just because they haven't articulated it in a way that sells. And so teaching nerds how to speak, I, I think is, is partly why the book exists. And, and I'm sorry, I forgot where the question was taking me, but I kind of rambled for a while. So I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine that's success okay what is one thing that no one knows about you Ooh. Mm. uh gosh i don't know i'd have to think about that one i i uh mm. apart from your family yeah i don't know i i don't really have i'm pretty much an open book let's talk about your your book average joe and the, how will it help us AverageJoeTechGenius.com is a website about the book. There are 26 videos on that site. If you go forward slash videos, you can quickly uh, get a sense for the book and what it's all about. Even from your mobile device, you can plot it in right there. And then uh, SlowCreate.com is the website for the framework, the free SlowCreate framework that helps anyone uh, think, speak, and create like a tech genius. And uh, the book's on Amazon and um you can follow me on Twitter at Shawnee Pants. Um, but I think the, my closing remark on that would be that there's, there's quite a bit there to digest when it comes to creating products, building those products, putting yourself in the right rooms, connecting and prox being proximal to the right people, and uh, a kind of a self-belief and a self-worth that, that is truly needed uh, for entrepreneurs and innovators that uh, we can overthink things and get into a, a quandary, uh, a mental block, um, so many forces working against us. You don't want to be uh, self-sabotaging um, as you work your career out. And so this is kind of why the book exists, and I think you'd enjoy it. Are these 26 videos free or someone have to um, subscribe to in, on the site. There are 26 free videos on the website to, to watch. They're brief, but they outline the concept and explain it. And a couple trailers in there, whatnot. But uh, we might have some paid courses in the future. But uh, for now, everything's free. Wow. Thank you. And how can we connect with you apart from your site? Yeah. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Shawnee Pants, S H A W N Y P A N T S. And my software company is at productperfect.com wow thank you for sharing so clan there will be more from sean in a moment if you are listening on one of the many podcasting platforms rather than my website and you're encouraged by sean's journey go to online success journey.com for a bonus version of the interview the online success journey is a wonderful membership community built for people searching for the path to success we are one big clan and you can be part of this community for free 
Once you have joined the clan, click on part 2 of Sean's journey or over 250 other journeys that are available and learn how you can find the right path for your own online success journey. That's a wrap clan. Remember, success is a journey. Patience and Sean. This is not the end of the journey. We hope you've enjoyed listening to part one and want to be sure you know there is a second part to this and every journey podcast at onlinesuccessjourney.com filled with even more success tips, uplifting stories, and even a bit of fun. There are dozens of episodes only available to the members of the Online Success Journey clan. Check out the website and click on Join the Clan for more information. Patience would like to thank you for listening to this podcast and she has a free audio gift for you at her website. Go to onlinesuccessjourney.com for instant access to this gift. Of course, you know that listening to the journeys of others helps each of us chart our own path. So make sure you're subscribed to be notified as each new interview is posted. There are so many ways to stay connected to the online success journey and to listen in. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we appreciate your help in telling others. One of the best ways to share the benefit you get is to rate and review it at Stitcher and other sites by clicking the stars or completing the ratings form. By clicking the thumbs up and leaving a comment on YouTube or liking and sharing the podcast on social media. To review the podcast within iTunes, simply open iTunes to the podcast, click on Ratings and Reviews, then write a review. On behalf of Patience and until next time, thanks once more for listening. It is our hope that this podcast will guide you on your own online success journey.